This is the inspiring story of Nick Leeson, a man who, despite his humble British working class roots, managed to achieve the pinnacle of the American dream, making a bunch of money doing fraud on stock exchanges and then single-handedly destroying the oldest bank in England. Specifically, Nick destroyed Barings Bank, named Barings after its founder Francis Baring and Bank after the word bank. Established in 1762, Barings was renowned as one of the oldest, bankiest banks around. In fact, it was once considered, quote, the sixth great European power after France, Russia, England, Prussia, and Austria, and like Prussia, it no longer exists thanks to a self-involved idiot with poor taste in hats. Our story begins in 1992. It was a big year for sleazy white dudes. Bill Clinton was elected president, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were topping the charts, and Nick Leeson was named general manager of the Barings Futures and Options Office on the Singapore International Monetary Exchange. Soon, Nick gained a reputation as a whiz kid on the foreign futures market, at one point being responsible for 10% of Barings' entire yearly profits. But it turns out that he was less a whiz kid in the sense that he was smart, and more a whiz kid in the sense that he was whizzing money away. Barings' downfall started with a simple mistake. One of Nick's employees was supposed to sell some futures contracts for a client, but they accidentally bought the futures instead. It was a dumb mistake, but before you judge them too harshly, consider that you, the viewer, has no idea what selling a future even means. Anyways, the mistake meant the client lost £20,000. Nick needed to make the client whole, but he couldn't just add £20,000 to the client's account out of nowhere, so he created something called an error account connected to the bank's funds, which he debited £20,000 so he could credit the client's account £20,000. While error accounts are a somewhat common accounting practice, the problem here was that Nick didn't want anyone to know about the mistake. So he came up with a plan. Instead of following normal practice and telling his bosses about the error account, he was going to make unauthorized trades to try and earn the £20,000 loss back and then zero out the error account. It was a brilliant plan, except for the part where it failed spectacularly. Nick didn't make the money back, and then things got much, much worse as Nick began using the account, which he named account 88888, as 8 is supposedly a lucky number in East Asia, to hide his own increasingly bad and desperate trades. By the end of 1992, he had lost £2 million. By 1993, he had lost £23 million. And by 1994, account 88888 was £208 million in the red. The tipping point came when Nick tried to make back his money by doing something called a short straddle. In order to understand short straddles, you have to understand two other financial instruments, a put and a call. And in order to illustrate, let's say that the asset we're dealing with is sandwiches, because I'm not allowed to go to lunch until I finish this script and that's all I can think about. A call, or a call option, is an agreement between a buyer and seller. The buyer pays the seller a certain amount of money, called a premium, and in exchange, the seller of the call option agrees that they will sell a sandwich to the buyer at a set price at a set time. What's interesting is that the buyer does not have to buy the sandwich, but if they choose to buy the sandwich, the seller must sell it to the buyer at the agreed upon price. So the buyer is hoping that the price of sandwiches will go up so that the buyer can exercise the call option, buy the sandwich from the seller at the cheap agreed upon price, and then resell it at the now high market price. The seller is hoping that the price of sandwiches will go down so that the buyer will not choose to exercise their option and won't buy the sandwich, and the seller just gets to keep the premium they were paid. A put is the opposite. The buyer gets the option to sell something to the seller of the put at a set price and time. And the incentives are reversed. The buyer hopes the price of sandwiches goes down, and the seller hopes the price goes up. Now, a short straddle is when you sell a call and a put on the same asset at the same time. When you short straddle, you're hoping that sandwiches will stay at the exact same price. That way, the buyers of both the put and the call won't have incentives to exercise their options, the seller isn't forced to buy or sell any sandwiches, and will make money on the premiums they were paid. The downside is that the short straddler's losses are theoretically unlimited because the price of sandwiches could go up to an infinite amount or alternately go all the way to zero. Now, Nick Leeson did a short straddle of the Tokyo and Singapore markets, essentially betting that the markets wouldn't move. Because God has a great sense of dark comedic timing, the Kobe earthquake hit Japan the next day, killing 6,000 people, leaving 45,000 homeless, and worst of all, destroying one badly dressed guy's market position thanks to the Asian markets tanking. In the end, he lost 827 million pounds, or about 1.4 billion dollars, more than twice Barings' total trading capital. 
Nick left a note that literally just read, I'm sorry, and fled, eventually getting arrested in Germany, sent to Singapore to stand trial, and sentenced to six and a half years in prison. But then Nick Leeson did what all great finance bros do failed upward. He got out of prison in four years on compassionate release because he was supposedly dying of colon cancer, but then he didn't die, then he wrote a book that got turned into a movie starring Ewan McGregor, and then he competed on Celebrity Big Brother and Celebrity Apprentice Ireland. Bearings, on the other hand, declared bankruptcy, got sold to ING for one pound, and hasn't appeared on Celebrity Big Brother even once. Now, I know what you're thinking. I'd love to use accounting tricks to take down one of the oldest banks in the world, but my math skills are just too rusty, and every time I try to refresh them or learn new stuff, it's confusing and boring and frustrating. That's why Brilliant is here, to make learning STEM concepts fun, exciting, and approachable by teaching you through interactive, hands-on problem solving. For example, Brilliant's Math for Quantitative Finance teaches you about key concepts like conditional probability through problems like this one. And if you're not into learning at all, but somehow got to the end of this video because you lost a bet or something, this holiday season, consider getting Brilliant not for yourself, but as a gift for the ambitious learners in your life. Your nerdy uncle, your annoying nephew won't stop talking about space, or your other annoying nephew who won't stop talking about cryptocurrency. You'll get 20% off Brilliant's premium annual subscription when you're one of the first 200 to click the button on screen or go to brilliant.org slash H-A-I.